<laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's a lot of fun. I wish we were all getting ready to watch the Dodgers later this evening, but oh well, wait until next year. Um, but I'm very glad to be doing this here because my lifelong interest in filmmaking began right across the street. Um, my, in the mid-1960s, my cousin Sharon was the personal assistant to Robert Vaughn when, he was, when they were producing Man From U.N.C.L.E. and they did that at MGM. And when I was 11, in the fall of 1966, Sharon gave me a tour of the lot, including, ooh, I get to use my pointer, the pointer, including old lot two right there. This is the 1940s, so we are here. See us right there? Um, <laughs> including driving all over there and seeing where Ivanhoe and, I mean, combat and all kinds of things, and Man From U.N.C.L.E. were filmed, and eating at the commissary and, you know, I was hooked for life, of course, by that. So uh, this is really a great spot, a great spot to be. And one other just brief announcement. This is, of course, Citizen Kane is an RKO film. And I'm working, my wife, who's the research director on all of my projects, is doing a major project for the University of Illinois, putting a lot of their of papers of one of my colleagues that were donated to the University of Illinois about RKO. And it's all complete, except she could use some filling in the blanks of names that are just not completely clear. So if you had any association with RKO uh, at any point in the past, please let me know afterward. We would love to talk to you even briefly about that. So um, anyway, so onward. So Citizen Kane is, is certainly one of the most explored and analyzed movies of all time by film critics and historians, and by any standards, one of the greatest, if not the greatest film of all time, certainly the greatest American film. Uh, but Citizen Kane is also a movie that is still filled with many secrets and many clues to its greatness. So what I'd like to do today is take a close look at what makes Citizen Kane a masterpiece. Uh, and I know there may be a few people here who have not seen Citizen Kane, and I may give away a few spoilers, like a lot. And, but I promise you'll still have plenty to enjoy after, for your fierce viewing. And afterward, I'm glad to sign books, or we can stay forever talking about the movie as long as you would like. So it's particularly appropriate, that again, that this program is here because the vast majority of Citizen Kane was shot right down the street. Uh, back when Culver Studios at the corner of Culver and Ince was best known as the headquarters of David O. Selznick, and you saw the building at the beginning of Gone with the Wind or Rebecca or any of those other movies. The studio complex itself was run by RKO and was called RKO Pathé at the time. And that's where most of the scenes from Citizen Kane were filmed. Uh, they were, uh, some were shot on, on stage three, which was in building, now known as building K. Um, but seven, so in the summer of 1940, Stages 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, and 14 were all occupied by Orson Welles and the production of Citizen Kane. So it occupied almost all of the studio space for a big chunk of that summer. So Citizen Kane definitely has a home in Culver City. And then right down the street from the main RKO Pathé facility, good old 40 Acres, which of course is no longer there. It's now a, since it was torn down in 1976 and is now a big, uh, you know, industrial park, oddly enough, with some production studios in it, uh, was also used for Citizen Kane. In fact, the only significant exterior scene, there's only one, in the film was shot at 40 Acres, which is um, after Kane marries his second wife, uh, they depart from the city hall in Trenton, New Jersey, and that was shot at 40 Acres. And by the way, that's not a bad slide on my part. Those vertical lines are all fake. They were added to make it look like a bad newsreel by grinding the film across the concrete floor up at RKO. Oh, the chills thinking about grinding film, but Robert Wise did that. So there are many, uh, so, oh, did I skip a page? I skipped a page, sorry. Um, so in one other little bit of ownership, in 1990, when I was working on my coffee table book on Citizen Kane, excuse me, um, the general manager of the Culver Studios lot named Bob Sercha gave me a tour of the whole lot. When he was a great guy, very helpful, very nice. And directly across the street from the studio, the building is still there. What is inside is not. It's long gone. 
was storage for some of the props for Citizen Kane, which were still there. And I took these photos. That statue is from the Great Hall in Xanadu, and the crate next to it is one of the many crates that was in the final scene. Um, those were all there. I gladly would have stolen them if I had had the chance. They've all since been sold at auction. Um, but they were all there in 1990. So, uh, but, so as a quick refresher for everyone, let's do a very quick summary of Citizen Kane. So first, in a mountaintop palace, the newspaper publisher Charles Foster Kane lies dying. His last word is, Rosa. yeah. Thompson, a reporter from a newsreel company, is assigned to find the meaning of Rosebud. And he learns what he can about Kane's earliest days in his childhood from the memoirs of Walter Thatcher, his banker and guardian. Uh, Thompson then interviews Mr. Bernstein, who was Kane's business manager, Jed Leland, his former best friend, Susan, his second wife, and Raymond, Kane's sleazy butler, I think my favorite character in the whole movie. Um, but Thompson has no success in learning the secrets, uh, the identity of Rosebud. And he decides that Rosebud is just a missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle that, of Kane's life. Uh, as the film ends, we see the leftovers from Kane's life being burned and the sled that belonged to Charles when he was eight years old is tossed in the fire. Across the front is the word Rosebud. So there are many ways to study a film. One, and one way is what I call the banana split theory. You can enjoy a film like an entire banana split, or you can savor the movie as individual ingredients. And I always regret putting those slides in because now I'm craving a banana split. So um, in other words, you can enjoy Citizen Kane as a two-hour experience that unfolds in front of you, or even better, you can appreciate how the individual elements all came together, come together. Because any film is a sum of parts, of many parts, and a great movie a truly great movie is created when a director's vision can be accomplished by merging that vision with the talented people behind the scenes who form that team to create it. And what makes Citizen Kane such a great film, and it's really quite simple, is how the visual genius of Orson Welles came together with the work of the talented artists and technicians at RKO. Uh, together, Welles and his team at RKO used every element of filmmaking to create brilliant solutions to questions of telling a story about the biggest human issues, friendship, love, power, betrayal. So let's take a look at how they did it. And here's the 30 second story of how we got to Citizen Kane. First, of course, Orson Welles, young genius, accomplished artist, uh, a writer and a painter in his teens. Here he is at age 16, traveling alone in Ireland with his faithful donkey. Um, when he was 19, he wound up on Broadway and then branched out into radio. Uh, by the time, by the way, he called this conducting radio, not directing radio, interesting. Um, by the time he was 23, Wells was an American radio star, but he became an international sensation on October 30th, 1938, with his radio broadcast of War of the Worlds, which convinced thousands of people that America was being invaded by Martians. So Wells at this point was already interested, Hollywood was already interested in Wells at this point, but after War of the Worlds, he was actively pursued by the major studios. And every, all of the studios, one way or another, wanted Wells. In fact, Warner Brothers even tested him. But it was RKO, one of the smaller studios, that dangled the offer that Wells had to grab. RKO gave Wells near complete creative control, not full creative control, but near complete creative control, including the right to the final cut which was very rare in Hollywood for anyone, but unheard of for a first time filmmaker. So in the summer of 1939, Wells came to Los Angeles, 24 years old, a novice in the Hollywood studio system during its golden age. Uh, as after two false starts on two movies that didn't make it, uh, Wells settled on the story of the rise and fall of a powerful newspaper publisher, the story that became Citizen Kane. So in February of 1940, Wells assigned the creation of the draft script to Herman Mankiewicz uh, and lo a longtime writer at several of the studios, all of the studios who fired him one time or another. Um, Wells then formed his team to create the film. Now, any discussion of Citizen Kane, and I'll talk about several people today, but two in particular. At first, uh, special credit goes to cinematographer Greg Toland, who was Wells' creative partner and the inspiration for 
all the memorable, vis memorable visuals in the film. Uh, Tolan was a legend already in Hollywood, and the filmmaking techniques he refined for Citizen Kane are still just as important today. Uh, the second member of the team, who looks like a movie actor himself, was Perry Ferguson, the production designer. Uh, Ferguson translated Wells's ideas for the visuals into practical designs for the sets and worked with Tolan on lighting, camera angles, and designs to complete the ideas and with a very strong sense of keeping the budget under control. Um, so Wells, Tolan, and Ferguson created a visual plan for Citizen Kane. The visual plan was created not just, not just to decide how the movie would look. Wells' goal was that every element of filmmaking should contribute to telling the story. In other words, as Sidney Pollack said about Citizen Kane, every shot has an idea. There's a concept and an idea being executed in every second of the film. So how did they do this? Uh, let me emphasize that there's nothing new about the tools in film, of filmmaking used in Citizen Kane, even in 1940. What was groundbreaking in Citizen Kane was how Wells and his team used these tools to tell their story. What came out of the visual plan were answers to many questions. How do you use tools of filmmaking to show the passage of time? or how a marriage begins and fails, or how a newspaper publisher can be both a friend of the oppressed and a promoter of reckless journalism. And how do you make those ideas visually interesting, and there's the real challenge, and carry the story at the same time. So the visual plan had three main goals. Here's a hint of one. At the core of the plan was realism, creating a realistic look and feel for the film. So viewers felt like they were eyewitnesses to real life. Every detail, whoops, there we go. Every detail in every scene helps to advance the story. The set decoration, the costumes, the props, everything. I mean, this could be walking into someone's room. And I'm gonna divert just for a second because we're about to talk about deep sets. This set was originally designed as one room. But once they started deciding on the visual plan, they added the second room behind. Ooh, I get to use my laser pointer. It's this whole separate room behind just to add depth and realism to the shot. So all of these scenes are real, whether they were elaborate scenes like the one we just looked at, or even simple, stark sets like this. They are all telling a story about the characters and the incidents at that time. So another way, another way to enhance realism is by using deep sets that extended far into the background. And because deep sets are visually appealing. They look, to us, they look interesting and seem real. But there's more to it than that. Um, a deep set allows deep focus. And of course, that's nothing new today. But then, Wells could highlight several issues at the same time. In most movies in the 1940s, if you think about even the really good movies that had the money to spend, the action moves almost always from left to right or right to left. There's very little moving back and forth, which was very limiting. Um, on a deep set, Wells had much more creative freedom. So in this scene in particular, he moves Kane all the way from where he's sitting here, back to there, 30 feet back, and then back again just to show his impatience and humiliation because what he's doing here is he's signing his failed empire back to his former banker when he's bankrupt. So Wells had that kind of freedom to move characters naturally through a scene, which including front to back and back to front. So for instance, here's the scene when Kane as a boy is signed away to the guardianship of a bank, the idea of an eight-year-old being signed away to a bank. So this scene begins with Mary, his mother, and Thatcher, his, the banker, who's going to take control of Kane. They start back here with that open window, and they walk all the way and sit down here as the camera pulls back, and they're now discussing the terms of the agreement that's going to put young Charles in the conservatorship of a bank. So we have in the front, we have Mary and Thatcher talking about the agreement and getting ready to sign it. We have scummy dad complaining about it, why he has no right in the say, say in this matter until he hears that he's gonna get $50,000 a year for life. And all this is going on while in the background, little Charles is playing in the snow, probably hap truly happy for the last time in his life. And a deep set doesn't have to be huge. Even small fragments of sets were created with depth and realism in mind. Here, banker Thatcher, now 20 years later, is dictating a letter to, to Kane. Um, this set could have just been Thatcher standing in front of a window with curtains closed. Instead, 
Perry Ferguson, the production designer, created a window with background and multiple layers. We've got curtains, the window itself, and by the way, it's frosted with ice, the background with the bars uh, across the street, the buildings across the street. They didn't have to do that. It didn't cost anything, but because they were looking for that depth and realism in every scene, this you know, very short scene, that, that shot is on screen for about 15 seconds. They did that sort of thing. And you might think that a deep set would be, wouldn't be useful for a close-up, but here it, it is. Here's a scene of the staff of the New York Enquirer newspaper with a trophy they are going to give to Mr. Kane as he returns from Europe. All of the actors are only a few feet from the camera, including Mr. Bernstein right here, who's inches from the camera, all of them except one, the copy boy, who's in the, all the way in the back, that's 25 feet away, and he yells, here he comes, as Kane arrives. This instantly makes the, the room feel more real. So the simple set of even a breakfast table was designed to increase the depth. We have windows, curtains, trees, buildings in the background. You can't see them very well. There are actually buildings back there. And I love this touch especially. Look at these lace panels. They didn't have to put lace panels in, but because they're holes, you can get the increased depth of seeing through the lace panels, all very thoughtfully designed. Um, and then, of course, add to the deep focus the goal of showing ceilings in many scenes. Showing the ceiling of a set was typically not done at the time because most of the lighting uh, for the sets came from the rafters of the stage. Again, showing ceilings was not a first. Here's a scene from Stagecoach, shot two years before Citizen Kane, and you can see the John Ford directing. John Ford, one of Orson Welles' idols, using the ceilings. Um, but for Citizen Kane, the key was how the ceilings were used. For a start, in real life, you see ceilings. Uh, so showing the ceiling makes any scene look more real. And they just shot with lighting from the front, with all those broadside lights that were used for Technicolor. Um, and in Citizen Kane, each ceiling looked different. They were marked with skylights like this one, or shadows, or decorations to increase the realism. And by including ceilings, Orson Welles could shoot from low angles. And low shots became just one more tool in his creative arsenal. So this is very low, uh, some, including this shot. Some of the, sh the fact this shot was just this, was shot like this, were so low that they, the crew cut through the floor of the set. Uh, here's Ruth Warwick, who plays Kane's first wife. She's next to a set, a section of set over here that was deliberately built, elevated, so they didn't have to cut through particularly, and you didn't have to crawl down into a hole. This was used to accommodate Wells' low shots. The other, one of the other elements of the, of the visual plan, it was just as important to the plan to create a seamless flow storytelling that moves effortlessly from scene to scene. And when you go home tonight to watch Citizen Kane, you can see practically every scene has seamless flow of one kind or another. A couple that we'll show here in a minute, a couple just beautiful dissolves that work very well from shot to shot. So what does a seamless flow help? For a start, it creates graceful transitions that help move from one's idea to the next. So here's how a graceful transition illustrates in one second that creates the idea of how Kane's campaign for governor grew from nothing to power politics on the biggest scale. So we've got Jed Leland, his best friend, campaigning in a back alley with you know five people standing there. And Leland is talking about Charles Foster Kane, friend of the working man, who entered upon this campaign, dot, dot, dot. And we cut to Kane himself saying, with one purpose only, and then talking about the campaign. So in these two shots, we see Kane's Kane's uh, power grow from the small grassroots effort to big time politics. Uh, the seamless flow was also used for another goal, to create innovative ways of ways to show the passage of time. So here's the goal. How do you show Kane's success in building up his newspaper? Simply by moving one scene to another. So this is Kane's, Kane, Bernstein, and Leland's first day on the Enquirer, and they go look at the competition. And Kane's saying this is a you know, great idea for a newspaper, 495,000. Uh, and Bernstein says, well, Mr. Kane, there's a reason why the Chronicle's a great newspaper, because they've got the greatest newspaper staff in the world. And it zooms in on this photo, which is right here. And they say the greatest, and Kane says, the greatest newspaper staff in the world. Well, and what we see next is that photo dissolves to the same photo being taken six years later, when all these people now work for Charles Foster Kane at the Enquirer. Um, 
and then they're all going to the party celebrating the fact that the Inquirer now has the biggest circulation in New York. So the seamless flow in Citizen Kane also illustrates one of the great strengths of the film, which is how Wells took complicated ideas and translated them in only a few minutes or a few seconds of film. For example, and this is one of the most famous scenes in Citizen Kane, how do you show the collapse of a marriage from start to finish in just a few seconds? And Wells could have dragged the scene marriage out for scene after scene, and in the scripts, the original scripts, it was dragged out for scene after scene. Instead, in one of the most famous sequences in Citizen Kane, here's how he did it, where we see the very beginning of Kane and Emily in their relationship. Soon after their marriage, they're young and in love, and with each subsequent scene, the relationship, scene, oops, the relationship grows more strained and even more strained as they talk, and until finally, they don't talk at all, and with each buried in their morning newspaper. And that's how the scene ends, with no talking at all. So the scene's not, o so not only is that accomplished very powerfully, but he also managed to accomplish a few other things along the way, like establishing Emily as a snob and a bigot when she asks Cain if Mr. Bernstein, who is Jewish, can be stopped from visiting their son's nursery, and Cain says no. And we see Cain's values starting to fall apart too, when Emily says, well, people will think, and he cuts her off and says, what I tell them to think. And he puts down his coffee cup, clink, and sort of that ends the discussion. So in the end, back to this shot, they, Wells didn't even have to use dialogue. The marriage was done. Um, and the silence tells it all. And I love especially, let's talk about nice touches, how the last shot, the props tell the story. While Kane is reading his own New York Inquirer, Emily is reading the Chronicle. That's a, that's a lot of results for three minutes of film. So here's another problem solved. How do you show Cain as a social reformer and a reckless journalist at the same time? So Wells created a solution literally on the fly during production. This scene is in no draft of any script anywhere. I've never been able to find it. Um, and there's nothing in writing that exists today. This comes right after young Charles had been signed away to the custody of the bank. In every scene, in every time this, every draft, all seven drafts of the scripts, including the last one, this scene shows young Charles being taken away. He's crying on a train for his mother. He's yelling, mom, mom. And then it goes on to other things. So at that point, if you want to show Cain's rise to the top, it would take many, many, many scenes of Cain doing all kinds of things and all kinds of anecdotes that showed how he became a powerful publisher. And indeed, there was a lot of that in the script. Wells threw all of it out. 20 minutes of scenes were gone. Instead, he created a series of quick scenes that focus on Kane's banker. Not on, not on Kane, but on Kane's banker, Walter Thatcher, the man who took young Charles away from his family. So in seven scenes in 30 seconds, we see Thatcher reacting to Kane's exploits as both a crusading publisher and also as a ruthless scandal monger. So the first slide shows, shows Thatcher on a train reading Traction, Trust Exposed in the headline. Traction, traction is the old time term for uh, streetcar. Uh, then Traction, Trust Bleeds Public White. Then Traction, Trust Smashed by Inquirer. This one's on screen for barely one second. Um, then Landlords Refuse to Clear Slums. And then finally, Inquirer Wins Slum Fight. Uh, but then it starts to go downhill for Kane, uh, with Wall Street backs copper swindle, um, and which is a real stunner for Thatcher. Now there's an extra special treat in this shot that was put in. You'll see that um, we are on the outside of the window behind Thatcher looking in. And we know that because you can see the reflection of the buildings behind right there. So we're outside peeking in at, th at Thatcher in his disgust as he looks to us uh, with the reflections. And finally, copper robbers indicted, oh golly. And then the final ludicrous headline, Galleons of Spain off Jersey Coast. Uh, and then we see Cain as a young man for the first time as Thatcher's about to confront him. So I love the fact that Thatcher, who at this point in the film is probably the least likable character in the whole movie, looks directly to us for sympathy and breaking through that fourth wall. This draws us into the film, which is an incredible directing touch, all done on the fly by Wells. 
So we're, we're, we're getting throughout Citizen Kane, as crafted by Wells and his team developing the visual plan, are brief images of Kane, these tiny slices of life that describe him as no film had done before in describing a character. And this seems like a, a time to talk about just one little quick thing about the biggest mystery of, of Citizen Kane, which is the mystery of the final script. Uh, in July of 1940, Wells completed his editing of a final script. Uh, only two weeks before production began, the script is dated July 16th, 1940. The script was still much too long. It was probably three and a half hours at this point. And many of the ideas that were important to Wells were not refined. Even worse, several key scenes were not even written at all, including those scenes of Thatcher that we just saw. What happened then was what always happened on Wells' projects, on Broadway and on radio first and in the movies. Wells did more editing literally at the last second, sometimes even on the set working with actors to create the scenes, creating new scenes that turned out to be the, some of the most brilliant parts of the film. Uh, I have to add, this leaves a question which just kills me every time I say it. What happened to that new material? Uh, you can look in Wells' personal papers, in studio files, university archives, and you will find nothing. Wells never described how he edited during the production or how he created those new scenes, and no one ever asked him. Uh, there's no written record of any kind. I only wish I had gotten started earlier before he passed away, so I could have asked him. But at least we know the results of what Wells accomplished and how he edited and added to create master strokes to, uh, in creating the film. And here's one of the most important examples. How do you make Kane appealing, even when he behaves very badly? In all of the draft scripts, Kane takes over the New York Enquirer newspaper at the beginning in his first scenes as a young man. It's abrupt, it's cruel. Kane arrives, he meets the editor, and in a couple of minutes, he coldly drives Carter, the editor, away from the newspaper, forcing him to resign. Um, instead, in an extraordinary creative decision, Wells recrafted the entire scene of Kane's arrival at the Enquirer. Uh, suddenly, it was breezy comedy with mistaken identities, slapstick dialogue, rapid fire, you know, rapid fire dialogue, all while Kane smoothly assumes control of the paper. At the end of the sequence, Wells' Wells's changes lead to the same result. Editor Carter is eased out, but we never even see him resign. We just see him walk away. Instead, Kane appears dynamic and charming, and we barely even notice how ruthless he is. Wells has created the beginning of an engaging, larger-than-life character for Charles Foster Kane. So changes that seem simple create a lot of visual interest. And here's just the most simple one, which I didn't even notice for years of looking at the film. In the final script, there are several critical moments in Kane's life which begin with him sitting down. In fact, one where he's sitting down looking out a window. Oh, please. Um, Wells rewrote these scenes so Kane is on his feet and moving from the start of the scene, creating more visually interesting performances. And my favorite uh, actually makes a statement, which is when Raymond, the butler, tells Kane that Susan, his second wife, is packing to leave him. And as written, Kane is motionless, again, sitting, looking out a window. But what Wells did was he changed it so Kane is walking across uh, the Great Hall of Xanadu, the top steps of the Great Hall of Xanadu. And as Raymond approaches him, you see Kane quicken his step, trying to almost to avoid the inevitable that he knows is coming because he slapped Susan the night before. Uh, he's trying to avoid that confrontation which occurs, is occurring right here when Raymond says that, you know, she's packing to leave. Uh, keeping actors moving may seem like a small thing, but it's a big, makes a big difference in visual interest. And of course, that was Wells' whole interest, was the visual interest. Several scenes were changed to emphasize visuals instead of dialogue. So, uh, Kane's first, Kane's second wife, Susan, uh, locks herself in her bedroom and tries to kill herself. The script includes half a page of dialogue between Kane and his butler. Kane wants to know if the butler has keys to Susan's room. The butler says no. They talk back and forth. Kane there declares he's going to break down the door, and only then they break in. So as it appears in the movie, we see Susan breathing, la very labored breathing with her medi for the medicine she's overdosed in front. You see her, you hear knocking, 
and then louder knocking and then pounding on the door and then they break in. There's no dialogue because it wasn't necessary. Uh, and Wells took out all that conversation uh, because the conversation really wasn't necessary. And the first thing we hear is at this point when Cain calls for the doctor. So much of Cain's editing of the script trim what we know of Cain himself. The key to portraying Cain was found not in the reasons why he did what he did, but showing how his decisions affected himself and others. Cain saw, Wells saw Cain as a colossal failure, what, what Wells called a damned man. Uh, in all of the films that Wells directed, all of them, the central character is always a failed or doomed figure. There are no successes in, in Orson Welles' films, and usually a victim of his own behavior. In Citizen Kane, we never know why Kane alienates his first wife. We don't know why he drives his wife into a career as an opera singer that is so soul-crushing that she tries, to, she tries to kill herself, or why he fires his best friend. To Wells, the reasons why Kane did what he did were not important. What was important were the consequences of his actions. So by the end of the movie, the reporter who's been searching for the meaning of Rosebud shares our frustrations about Kane. Wells delivered a long, there was a long description of Kane's behavior that Thompson, who's right here at the end, delivers, and that's all cut. Instead, we let Thompson focus on the mystery of Kane. What Thompson says is, Kane was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it. Maybe Rosebud was something he couldn't get or something he lost. Anyway, it wouldn't have explained anything. I don't think any word can explain a man's life. I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle, a missing piece. So, in fact, in the, uh, also one of my favorite scenes, they're all my favorite scenes, um, <laughs> Wells changed the entire meaning of one of the scenes to show that Cain was a mystery even to himself. In the draft scripts, every draft script, Wells or Cain destroys Susan's bedroom and walks out of the room. And as written, Cain walks down a hallway that has mirrors on both sides, like at Versailles, and he stands there looking at himself, seeing, as they see in the script, a thousand Cains. Well, that's not what it happens in the movie. In the movie, he turns the, Wells turned this idea upside down. When Cain walks through the hall of mirrors, he's oblivious. He never sees the reflections. He just walks straight through. So in other words, K Citizen Kane is a vivid example, start to finish, of how to create dozens of answers to filmmaking problems. We could really take every scene and look at it, how it, how it solved a filmmaking problem. Uh, now we've looked at some of the bigger issues about Citizen Kane, and we're gonna look at a few more in a minute, but at this point I wanna, I wanna address an issue, and I will be able to hope, I will be able to go wherever hope is. I will be able to go all the way through, my voice is hanging in there. Um, the, since this issue normally comes up in in, um, uh, in questions and answers, I might as well deal with it now, which is the connection between the real life newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst, and the creation of the character of Charles Foster Kane. So, where is he? There he is. Um, Hearst, was he or wasn't he Charles Foster Kane? William Randolph Hearst, the most powerful media mogul of his day, the 1930s version of Rupert Murdoch, owned newspapers, magazines, radio stations, wire services, was the character of Charles Foster Kane based on William Randolph Hearst. We could spend hours on this, and there's a whole section in my book on it, but the short reply to this question is actually two answers. No. Uh, first, the personality of many powerful men was used to create the character of Charles Foster Kane. Publisher Joseph Pulitzer, banker Otto Kahn, Circus owner John Ringling North, who had a huge house in Florida, just like Charles Foster Kane did, and many others. Number two, yes, there is no question that Charles Foster Kane was created, when he was created, that Hearst was a principal personality used to develop the character. No doubt about it. Um, but since this program is about the creation of Citizen Kane, I just want to point out three decisions in creating Kane, the character, that would have convinced anyone who knew Hearst that he was the only model for Charles Foster Kane, which was a disaster for Orson Welles. And they were huge mistakes. Um, so let's look at one of, number one. In every version of the script, the young Charles is identified as either age five or age seven. Uh, fine. 
And that never changed. Even in the final, final, final scripts, he was age, he was age seven. Uh, in fact, we know that in Thatcher's memoirs, I first, I first encountered, encountered Mr. Kane in 1871. Okay. Um, so, in this, but then when we get to the credits for the film, the second one from the bottom, Buddy Swan, who played Kane, for no particular reason that anyone can understand, it was changed to age eight. Now, by being age, changed to age eight, and you met him in 1871, that means that you were born in 1863, and what do you know, William Randolph Hearst was born in 1863. No reason in the world that that had to have been done, but it was. Um, now, maybe one of the reasons why was Buddy Swan was, didn't look six or five or seven, he did look eight, but the point is still, um, it was not a good idea. Number two, and this is again, Hearst intimates are what we're talking about. People, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, just one. Um, anyone who knew Hearst well, who had ever been to San Simeon would have known this issue. Uh, we see Kane and Emily young and in love, their first time together. The camera zooms in on them in this scene and we see condiments in bottles, ketchup and mustard on the table. So with all this china and wonderful silver and a beautiful setting, actual condiments. Well, at Hearst Castle, even today, when you see this you know, 18th, century, 18th century silver and platware that belonged to Catherine the Great and tapestries in the background, they still put, because that, they still put condiments on the table because that's what William Randolph Hearst wanted. So, oh well, so that's oh well number two. There was no reason for it. They did not have to do it. Uh, number three, when we're talking about Charles Foster Kane owning, owning forests and gold mines and ocean liners and department stores and apartment buildings, they use this shot to show apartment buildings in New York. This is on Riverside Drive. They could have used any street in New York. But this building right there happens to be the Clarendon apartment building, which is still there, uh, which was owned at the time by William Randolph Hearst. They did not need to do that, but they did. And it's inexplicably stupid they did, but they did. Um, even worse, though, in the reorganization of Hearst's fortune when he started to go under because he spent too much on Hearst Castle, uh, he lost the Clarendon. It was foreclosed on him. So that would have been a tremendously painful and embarrassing incident for anyone who knew Hearst, and that just fed the fuel. And But why is that important? Because all these things important or anything else is because Hearst and his people hated Citizen Kane and did everything they could do to suppress it or even destroy it. They tried to buy the film and destroy it. Um, Citizen Kane, you know, a lot of people think that it was not a success at the time it came out. It was a huge critical success when it came out. It was considered one of the great movies of all time, even in 1941 when it was released. But Hearst's threats to theater owners and to theater chains kept the film from appearing in hundreds of theaters or being seen by thousands of people, which ruined any chances for financial success of the movie. Uh, in the final analysis, in its first release, Citizen Kane lost, brace yourself, $150,000. Ooh, you know, the catering budget for two days on the Avengers. Um, so, and that really just changed the whole course of Wells' career. So, away from Hearst, and we can, I'm certainly glad to entertain any questions afterward, but Back to the main story. One of the great subtle tools that's used throughout Citizen Kane, which most people probably never would have noticed, was the way they used ways, creative ways to bridge from one scene to another that appeared earlier in the film. For instance, a few minutes before the end of the movie, this is the Great Hall of Xanadu, we see a reporter, actually played by character actor Arthur O'Connell, who later went on to do many films, he's carrying this basket. He then, in a few minutes, he just sets it aside and it's just lying there on the floor at the end of the movie. Well, that basket was in the first you know, few minutes when Kane arrives on his first day at the Enquirer. There's the same basket, which we'd seen an hour and a half before. Uh, when Bernstein crashes through the door of the Enquirer with all of Kane's belongings, and there, actually there's the basket again, but we see this bed frame. This is, you know, fairly close to the beginning. This is 20 minutes into the film. 
That bed frame again shows up at the end during Greg Tolan's astounding crane shot that covers all of Kane's treasures of leftovers from his life. We see the bed frame again. There it is. And I love this, uh, back to the same shot. There are two bundles of newspapers that are decaying. They probably poured coffee all over them and let them soak, which was a typical way to do it. We can't see the front of the bundles, but there's no question that they're, they're bundles of that original first edition of the Enquirer that we see in large piles at the beginning of Kane's tenure at the Enquirer. Now, some of these links between scenes are almost unnoticeable. For instance, when Kane is given his triumphant speech at Madison Square Garden, a photographer up there on the post takes a photograph with a flashbulb of Emily, their son, and Kane. So you would think nothing of it. It was just, you know, hold it, Mr. Kane, they take the photograph. But that photo has already appeared in the film. And it goes all the way back to the beginning when we hear about Emily and her son being killed in, a in an auto accident that's in the newsreel at the beginning. Some details are particularly well hidden. I have one of my favorites, uh, when Kane meets Susan Alexander, who will later become his first wife, or second wife, here's a shot of Susan in her boarding house room. And on her dressing table, there's the snow globe, which is totally not even recognized. It just happens to be there. It's the same one that Kane will later discover when he destroys Susan's room at, at Xanadu and reminds him of Rosebud. Uh, and of course, he's holding when he dies. So just in terms of triumphs of making a filmmaking, we, the, any discussion of problem solving in Citizen Kane has to include the expertise of Maurice Siderman, who is a legendary makeup artist who got his first big break working on Citizen Kane. Makeup for aging was critical for all of the stars of the film, but especially for Wells, who he has aged from his own age of 20, well, 24 and 25 to 78. And we'll, we can talk about the details, we'll have to talk about the details of Siderman's makeup another time, except to point out the results. Um, keep in mind that this character at age 53 and this character at age 75 are both this 25 year old kid. So that's incredible work, just incredible groundbreaking work on makeup by Maurice Siderman, which also included padded costumes, uh, neck waddles, you name it. It was just incredible. Uh, Budget, keeping an eye on the budget, but also making a strong visual impact was critical to the movie. It was right when World War II was starting, even though the United States wasn't involved yet. The, the RKO had lost its entire European audience, so they were trying to watch every dime and have creative solutions that worked at the same time. So how do you show, from Susan's perspective, her debut, her horrible opera debut, and the horror she felt? So the way you do that without spending a fortune to do it was the curtain rises and there's poor Susan in the middle of the stage alone and terrified, singing terribly, um, and the lights and the audience in the, in the background. But you can't see the audience. The audience can never be shown. But it's there. All you see are the lights and it makes, it's, might as well be the unsympathetic, unseen crowd. Um, even more telling, this is Susan's bedroom before Kane destroys it. Uh, this talks, this is just a great example of how psychologically bruised Susan is her whole life. There are hints of her character and most viewers would never see them because you only see glimpses of this room. In her room as created are nine photographs of herself. Susan had nine photographs. Here are three of them in just this one particular corner and they're all scenes of her in opera. So they're shots of herself in operas that she hated to perform. I don't know what that tells us about her, but it's certainly something. Um, the other great detail in, the, in Citizen Kane is the newspapers, which are practically characters themselves. The newspapers are all fake. They were all printed by Earl's Hayes, Earl Hayes Press, which is still there out in Sun Valley. Uh, they make specialty props for creating, they create props for movies and TV. If you've ever seen a package of cigarettes that looks like they're uh, Marlboro, but they're actually, oh God, I'm Morley. like, thank you, Morley. Morley cigarettes, that's Earl Hayes, but it's newspapers, magazines, and in this case, they would create their own text if you wanted it, but Wells had everything created for it by a reporter named Ed Blake, who was a real life reporter, and he created every headline, every sub, you know, the lower cut. I love the arrows. You never see those in newspapers anymore. 
political cartoons, subheads, and text. And in many of them, you can actually read the top end of the text. And Blake created all of this content for Kane's fictional world. And most of these, like this one, is on screen for less than a second. We can't see it in the movie, but we can certainly see it here. Um, and of course, some of these newspapers tell a lot about Kane's own story. So here's the friend of the Inquirer after Kane dies, finds place, in, whoops, finds place in U.S. Hall of Fame. Entire nation mourns as great publisher, you know, as outstanding American lifetime of service. Yeah, right. Um, uh, but the competition newspaper founds, finds the worst possible photo of Kane, and oh yeah, he dies at Xanadu Estate. Death of publisher finds few who will mourn him. Probably closer to the truth. Um, and then fi finally on the sets, there's just one more thing that's really wonderful to notice is the dark side of Kane and his values. As the movie goes on, the movie gets darker and darker. And here's a great example. When Kane first arrives at the New York Inquirer, it's bright and cheery, it's busy. Uh, but when he arrives later, after Susan's disastrous debut at the Chicago Inquirer, it's dark, forbidding. The set was constructed, this is so, so smart, whoops, where everything here, all the stuff is set forward and the, the, the walls are set back. They're away from us. You can see them now if you're looking for them on the, on the screen. They're set back, they're dark, painted a dark gray, so when Kane strides across the newsroom, much of the set is surrounded by this dark abyss. And then I can't resist talking about the letter K because it's everywhere in Citizen Kane. Um, the, the initial K is visually prominent in every part of Kane's life. And to me, it's interesting he used K and not CFK for Charles Foster Kane, but he did. So we see the Kane in the Iron Gate above Xanadu, in the ice block that's at the Inquirer party, uh, his personal, Kane's personal accessories, they're everywhere in his accessories. Edward Stevenson, the costume designer, included a K on the pocket of his robe, on a stick pin when Kane gets married, on an even bigger stick pin when uh, the candidate Kane uh, was wearing at Madison Square Garden, uh, and then things which are practically impossible to see, like the K embroidered in white on white into his shirt, and even less visible, the K's on his collar when he's talking with Thatcher in the first scene of the movie. Uh, and by the way, there are also K's on his cuffs, which you can't see here. Uh, on his watch fob when he destroys Susan's room. But let's go back for a second to that scene where Kane slaps Susan. Uh, if you look at that, that lamp over in the corner, there are K's built into the lamp, which I just, another of my favorites, what a surprise. Um, and then just a quick note about the special effects. You'd think that a straightforward movie from the 1940s would not have a lot of special effects. About 40% of the film in Citizen Kane has some form of effect or another, whether it's dissolves or models, uh, specialized inserts, uh, back projections. And here are three examples. The only thing real in this scene are Raymond the butler and Kane down there in that tiny little scene. Everything else is either a very small version of a frame or painted back, a painted backdrop. Um, the New York Enquirer is the same way. The only part that's really a set is this part right to there. Everything else is background is backdrop painting. And I hate to give away too much, but if you watch the film, that smoke doesn't move. Sorry. <laughs> and then, of course, all the scenes at the beginning of the movie are one form, you know, partially model, partially back project, uh, uh, matte painting partially live people, all expertly crafted. But no matter what, in these scenes, that window is always in the same place, or is always shown prominently, except in the one scene where you see the lagoon, and then it's shown a reflection down here. Just amazing, amazing special effects. So add to all of what we talked about, spectacular sets, the dramatic use of light and shadow, uh, and then the music, which Bernard Herrmann wrote his first score. Uh, he, did, he was nominated for an Academy Award for this movie. He lost to himself because uh, he was in, um, he wrote The Devil and Daniel Webster, also known as All the Money Can Buy, which he did win for the same year. Um, I wish we had more time because we could explore the music uh, because the soundtrack is really one of the great achievements. And what I can encourage you to do when you watch the movie is realize that there are two main themes. 
The very first notes the, of, the, of the music, and the very first scene when you see no trespassing, are what are called the power theme, which is a, a, this, this particular theme, which I will not sing for you. Um, then it's immediately followed by the rosebud theme, which you'll see as we're moving across the Xanadu estate. Sorry, we can't show film here. Um, these two themes are played through, in various forms throughout the movie. Uh, the power theme emphasizes Cain. The rosebud theme gives us hints throughout to what Rosebud is. And then at the end, they're merged together in this giant crash at the end of the movie. So with all of that that we've talked about, add, combine everything we've talked about to the great themes of a great story, love, friendship, betrayal, and power, and the sum is Citizen Kane. So I hope you can start to see Citizen Kane as one long exercise in brilliant problem solving. We just touch, begin to touch on some of the elements today, and of course I go, them, go into them in great detail in the book. And a big chunk of the book, it's two parts, goes to great lengths talking about Hearst and all the issues that came after the movie came out and the controversy about it and how it was nearly lost to us and how once the film was clearly going to be released, well, uh, Hearst turned his attention to trying to discredit Orson Welles at the beginning of what became communist red baiting. So that's a whole section of the book as well. So whether you watch Citizen Kane as an entire banana split, or you savor each ingredient as you go along. I even brought a banana, from, I didn't bring it for a prop. Uh, I hope I've offered you some insight as to how Orson Welles made Citizen Kane a masterpiece. So I hope you'll go home tonight, fire up some popcorn, and watch the movie. So thanks so much, I'm glad we've had a chance to talk. So I am glad to answer questions indefinitely. Yes, sir. What was the most surprising thing that you found when you were researching for the book or when you were researching Citizen Kane in general? Oh yeah, the most surprising thing by far was the amount that Wells added after the scripts were done. Um, in fact, uh, when Mank, the movie came out and I was interviewed by New Yorker and at the same time I was doing, uh, I was working with the University of Michigan teaches a course on the making of Citizen Kane and I'm involved in that. One thing led to another and I took a typewritten version of the final script, the third, the third revised final actual script, the one that RKO endorsed, and I put an overlay on top of that of all the changes, edits, deletions, and especially additions that Wells had done in different colors. And I just looked at it and went, oh my God, the amount of editing, just the amount of editing is incredible, but the amount of additions and the change, the entire change in tone that Wells created uh, was amazing, and that struck me. And of course, it kills me to say that because I could have asked William Allen, who played the reporter Thompson, who I did interview, you know, how did Orson do all that? But no one ever did. Peter Bogdanovich didn't when he interviewed Wells for 17 hours on Citizen Kane. None of the academics who did it, the people at French magazines didn't. And that, to me, is really the most important part about what happened is how and it's the same thing that Wells did with every production he ever did. He transforms ideas of his own into great filmmaking. So that was my biggest surprise. All right, cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Who else? Yes, Martin. You just mentioned a change of tone. Mm -hmm. What was the change from and to? The, move, the, the scripts as written were very Hollywoody. They They were written in the... the the tone, like when they talk about um, his marriage falling apart, with page after page of seeing it deteriorate, the to all that tone, I guess the tone may not even be the right word. To me, that's what it means, that the tone was really the conversion of lots of script into visual ideas. You see in 30 seconds, his marriage, or three minutes, his marriage fall apart, and that took 20 minutes probably before. You know, we don't need to see that. But you would see, if you read the third revised final script, it reads very much like most movies at the time. And the final version of it looks nothing like the movies at the time. So that's, I'm sorry, that's my version of what tone is. <laughs> sorry. Harlan. Yes, uh, yes Hope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some of you guys know that I worked in Hollywood in the film industry. My parents uh, were generational. My grandfather started in the late 20s, mm -hmm. and then um, my dad started in the 50s, and then I came in in 79. Uh, mm -hmm. But in 1974, about that time, my dad decided he was gonna open a prop house. 
and he decided he would go over to Laird International Studios, which is Culver Studios, and he said, okay, we're gonna lease the prop house that's on the lot, which is building O, which is now gone. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. My last job was, um, one of my last jobs was over on the lot, Big Little Lies, and I was reminiscing about being in Building O, which was our production offices and the gym, but it was the prop house. And right across from the prop house in 1974, when I was a little kid, there was this kind of a barn, and it's the room you're talking yes. about. It was mm -hmm. a storage house, and there was this, and I used to cruise around in there, and we used to have pigeons in Culver City. For those of you who remember our pigeons in Culver City, but then the crows took them away. When you would go into these old wooden buildings on the Culver lot back then, there'd be about mm, maybe this deep of pigeon poop on the ground. It was crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh, I'm, now crunch. I remember that now, yeah. And I saw this big white grizzly bear that looked like the one from the Adams family in the corner. And there was just, it was a playground for me. Fast forward, 1998, I'm doing a movie in Hawaii called uh, Mighty Joe Young. And Dina Merrill's husband was our producer. And he came up to me and he said, hey, guess what we found? I said, what'd you find? He said, we found Rosebud. I said, where the hell did you find Rosebud? He said, we found Rosebud in the warehouse building across from the prop house on yeah. the Culver lot, on the lot. Now, I was sick to my stomach because when my dad leased the space, the man who was there, what was his name, dad? Galen Watson. Galen said, you can have anything you want here. Can you imagine if I had found Rosebud and said, hey, mom, look at this sled. Isn't it cool? And my dad would have gone, oh, yep. Rosebud. But no, Dina Merrill and her husband got it. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for giving a shout out to Earl Hayes. Oh. Uh, yeah, he yeah. could have bought the whole Culver lot. What did, what did he say? Two and a so, half million plus the 40 acres. So when I, when I was there in 1990, uh, Bob Searcha told me that they had wanted, they had offered, <laughs> They had offered as a charity for a Hollywood auction, they had offered a big chunk of one of these crates that said Xanadu CF Kane, you know, like shipping address. And they, I think they were asking $5 for it. And of course, I don't even think it's sold. Now, all of these things, happy ending, have sold for a lot of money to a lot of people who can really care for them. Um, but wish one of them had been me. Uh, me too. Yeah, there's, yeah, I would have, yeah, there's so many things. I actually went into the prop house on the lot in 1990, and I bought a clock from the 60s, but there was nothing, I tried really hard, but there was nothing identifiable that they would sell me from the movie. Um, but these, they all, these all did go to auction, and they're all in safe-ish hands, but mostly private hands. Yes, and sir. I'm Wait. sure when I was cruising around in that little warehouse space, all of this was I'm sure there. it was. The, the warehouse is still there. The stuff is not. Yes, sir. Somewhere that there were three... Well, there were more than that because they burned, they had two to burn that were just balsa wood. Then there was the one that was actually used in the scenes where Thatcher is being pushed with the sled by young Charles. And there, was one that and there were, the and then there were backup ones. So Steven Spielberg bought one. Yes. There's another one that we talked about earlier that I'm not sure which one it is. <coughs> but, you know, the one that's re supposedly real was, was given in a, a, a lottery in 1942. Uh, to someone on the East Coast, and then that went for auction. The, the one that was supposedly in the film supposedly went to auction, and uh, uh, I've just blanked, Bonita, Bonita Granville, you know, at that time a child star, gave it to the person who won the auction, won the lottery, and then that's the one that sold for 225000 about 10 years ago. But I've seen photos of it, and it's still kind of oogy because it doesn't have iron, it has wood on the edges. It doesn't have the iron, the steel runners anymore. And it looks a lot like it, but I'm not sure. So, but yes, there were at least, answer, actually answering your question, there were at least five. Two with it burned, one that, you know, or two, I'm sorry, four. Two that burned and two that didn't, and the one that's used. So, the other thing I want to add, sure, wait. I'm not sure this is appropriate. Go ahead. The name. Oh, the name Rosebud? I go into great detail on that in the book, too. There are dozens of interpretations for that, and depending on who you ask. The one I... Oh, the one you're not talking about, which yeah. is that it's, the, it's, it's supposedly William Randolph Hearst's nickname for Marion Davies' genitalia. And um, <laughs> so 
Now, that came from, who, God, I think that came from Louise Brooks, who passed it around. And whether it was or it wasn't, enough people knew that, that it would have been. See, there are so many things that would have been very insulting, true or not, that would have been completely insulting to people who knew Hearst. You know, Xanadu was in Florida. It wasn't on the coast. It wasn't San Simeon. You know, it was in, you know, on the ocean. I mean, it wasn't on the ocean, so... Um, but all these things that were sort of close to Hearst, it was a big house with a zoo. He was rich. He had a wife involved in, well, opera, not movies. Uh, but, you know, Susan Alexander was a failure as an opera singer. Marion Davies was not a failure as a movie star. And so the whole Rosebud name, it could have been Louise Brooks' interpretation, but people probably believed it was, and that just added more fuel to the fire against Orson Welles. And, you know, the sad thing about that is, if Hearst had just let it lie, and it was much more his sons, or at least one of his sons, that was behind, and one of his cronies who was trying to make good in, in the company, and actually later became chief executive, um, Richard Berlin, he later became chief executive, if they just let it alone, let the movie go by, it would have been forgotten as an issue involving Hearst within months, weeks, days, as it is, I mean, we now know, remember William Randolph Hearst for two things, that he was an exploiter of the media for his own political needs and that he was the model for Charles Foster Kane and Citizen Kane. So, yeah, that's one of them. But the other ones were, it was a racehorse that actually did win the Kentucky Derby. It was the name of, Rosebud was the name of, of, of uh, Herman Mankiewicz's beloved bicycle. Uh, God, there were several others, um, but yeah, it went on and on. But Harlan, yes, sir. What is it that inspired you to undertake the writing of the book, which I'm sure took an awful lot of research and a lot of work? Well, I did a coffee table book in 1990, and that was inspired by the fact that I wrote a book about the film of films of 1939 for the anniversary in 1989, which was bought by Doubleday, and they paid for it, knowing full well that it was a competing book. And then when they saw the competing book, they canceled mine. So, uh, hey, they paid for it. Um, so I said, okay, let's get ahead of the game. What's the next big anniversary coming? And it was Citizen Kane. So uh, that became a coffee table book. And then the moment the coffee table book was done, I realized that it just wasn't enough telling the story. So for the 75th anniversary, I did the predecessor to this book, which was also a nonfiction narrative, and realized in the five years after that book came out, so much more became available that Angel City Press was willing to publish an expanded edition. And this, and it's 16,000 words longer than the one I did in, for the 75th anniversary. So there's a lot to be said. And so I think I finally have covered the subject. Um, <laughs> but you know, some of the things we talked about today are, are deliberately not in the book because there's just not room for everything. So, yes, sir. How much has media and journalism change today, and how much it, does it remain the same? Uh, well, if you look at Rupert Murdoch, it doesn't change very much at all. So um, they're using the media as a tool for your own political power is still done by, by publishers and of all, stri of all political stripes. Some of, it is, some of it is more personal than others. So, I mean, I cannot imagine, can you imagine what would happen today? The one aspect of this is that the way it would have been interpreted would have been much different today. Can you imagine if Rupert Murdoch decided that George Clooney's new movie was an insult to him and he was going to ban the movie from his, his TV stations and never interview George Clooney again? It wouldn't be mentioned in any of Rupert Murdoch's newspapers. That would be a huge story. And this story was covered, but it was not... I don't think it got nearly the, the coverage it deserved. And more importantly, if Rupert Murdoch went after George Clooney or Brad Pitt or Taylor Swift or anybody else today, that would increase the number of people who would want to see the movie. So there will always be political motivations behind, behind some elements of extremes in, in the media. Uh, in the case of William Randolph Hearst, probably much more than most because when I, and I cover this in detail in the book. In fact, a large chunk of the new material in the book is about this particular point, which is after it became clear that, they could, that Hearst could not stop 
Citizen Kane from being released, they started to go after Wells himself. And Wells was no communist, but he was very liberal and he supported liberal causes. And they did everything possible to discredit Wells and discredit his programs, the, the speeches he gave, they organ Hearst people organized with conservative groups to support them by covering, well, they covered, they worked with the American Legion to under, make them understand that they should go and, co and protest at a particular screening. And then they covered the screening. I mean, talk about, as Charles Foster Kane says, if you make the story big enough, if you make the headline big enough, it makes the story big enough. So there was a lot of that in those days. So good question, thank you. Hey, who else? Martin, feel free. During the production of the movie, yes, was have you got a sense if there was a sense that the people making it, or the studio, or Luella Parsons, or anybody, had a sense that a very special movie was being made on the lot? Luella Parsons didn't, but the crew, and the crew knew that they were doing something special because they had never worked on anything the way Orson Welles did, and with someone like Orson Welles. Wells had his conflicts with Mankiewicz, and that is clear. They worked them out, but because Wells was a writer himself. Wells was not an editor, he was not a composer, um, he was not a cinematographer. So with all those people that he, was co he collaborated with, they loved working with them, they thought that was one of the most special moments of their careers, and he was infinitely patient with actors, working with on hours on individual lines and taking shots until everyone was happy. So yes, they knew they were working on something special. Do they know they were working on something that great? No, not until the end. But even when they put the and movie- When you say the end, you mean until the movie was finished? When the movie screened, was finished, yes. And then they saw what the final product right. was. But even when, when reporters first saw the movie in January of 40, when most of the special effects weren't in, when a lot of the music wasn't in, they were still stunned at that point. So Life and Look and Red Book and Newsweek and Time, they all saw the movie then and they were, they, they, were, they were beyond words at that point. Did you get a sense if during the production people who were working on the movie sense that this was something special, that that then leaked out into either the film community or the general community? That, that Was there a buzz about this movie over and above the fact it was Orson Welles' first movie, blah, blah, blah? Yeah, to some extent, first because it was Welles working in Hollywood that put a giant magnifying glass on the production. So young, you know, 24-year-old making his first movie, almost complete creative control, quiet, interesting story about a newspaper publisher, but we really don't know what it's about. So that was getting out there. But as people finished their parts, they were talking about how enthusiastic they were. Because, you know, people trickled, you know, they'd finish their part, they'd go off and do what they were doing next, and they would talk to reporters. Yeah. And they were definitely saying this was something new and different in how it was going. So it began to leak out early, yes. One more, or as many as you want. I'm here for the duration. Wait, one more here. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I wish I could remember the antidote that uh, was said in Bogdanovich's book. I'm sorry, about what? The antidote that Bo in Bogdanovich's book uh -huh. about Orson Welles. Orson was living with him in his guest house for a very long time. Everybody knows that. He said, I wish you would write a book about me, and so that's how that all got going. But yeah. Bogdanovich talks about... You know, imagine, I wish I could remember the antidote, but it's, it's basically, imagine your very first movie is Citizen Kane, mm -hmm. and it destroyed him. You know, it, it, for every movie that ever happened after Citizen Kane was cursed mm -hmm. because of the success of Citizen Kane. Yep. And it just, it's interesting, just a couple things I'm listening to you say, well, they rehearsed lines on, you know, for hours on Citizen mm -hmm. Kane, and then I'm trying to think of the, uh, the film that Bogdanovich finished that came out, um, the, the wind. Other side of the wind. Other side of the wind, and you know, I've watched that, and what a mess it is, and, and it's, it's awesome, but at the same time, like, there was no plan. You know, it's amazing that all the planning that went into Citizen Kane, it seems like the further he went along in his career, and, and I, I know all these movies really well, he almost, you know, he, he was not afraid to say, okay, well, let's not do that. Yeah. And abandon it, and a, mo a lot of those movies never even got finished. Right. And, um, I'm sorry, continue. What, oh, go ahead. Wells did a great job of cursing himself. He could have done a lot of things differently in his career. Think about Laurence Olivier, who was very, by the way, Orson Welles was always a success as an actor. He was in constant demand as an actor. He could have been very happy, or should have been very happy, as an actor who did a lot of movies, 
you know, maybe not weighing 400 pounds would have been a good idea, but, you know, but it was only his directing that he had to fight for it. And then when he got it, he, one way or another, managed to curse the project, usually by leaving early. And that started here. I mean, there are memos that go back and forth at, at and I write about this too, where there are memos from the head of the, of one of the, not the, quite the head of the studio, but one level down, complaining to the special effects department, why aren't you guys finished with this? And they'd write back and say, uh, we are finished with this. Mr. Wells is out of town and has been for three weeks, and we can't get him to sign off on these things. That was very classic Orson behavior. So were the, movie, were the projects cursed? Only because Orson let them be. He could have been very happy as a director and an actor who did, went from one success as an actor to another, like Laurence Olivier did, making the occasional movie, brilliant movies like Hamlet and Henry V, and then Olivier would go off and do others. But he could never manage that. There was always that draw to other things, you know, just like, frankly, like his draw to other women. I mean, he was married to Rita Hayworth for about 10 minutes before he started cheating on her. You know, it's just this insatiable whatever to move on. And one of his great movies also. Yeah, Lady, uh, Lady from Shanghai, absolutely. So, yes. So, yes, he he's only has himself to blame. And he never, I'm sorry, one more thing about this is, People have told him over the years that they saw a lot of Charles Foster Kane in Orson Welles. And he said, I never really could see it. Okay, the rest of us could, um, because that, that kind of behavior. There's a man, if there ever was a man who you don't understand his motivations, but you see the consequences of his actions, it's Orson Welles, just like Charles Foster Kane. And that's sad, and I'm sorry, but we can always say we have Citizen Kane, Magnificent Ambersons, Touch of Evil, Chimes at Midnight, Lady from Shanghai, uh, The Trial, uh, the, and the other 14 movies he directed, not even counting the movies he acted in. It's Third Man. Um, we have- Moby Dick. Moby Dick, yeah. Uh, uh, the movie about Leopold and Loeb. So all we can do, we can't regret those anymore. All we can do is just appreciate what he created and realize that even with those 19 films, he's probably he's still considered by many to be the most innovative director of all time. Well, speaking of the, the, the I wanted to segue to one more question, sure. if you don't mind, is Greg Tolan. You know, uh, everybody talks about Citizen Kane and how great it is. And, yes. and I, I think that, it, rightfully so, Orson Welles gets almost all the credit, but there is no Citizen King without Greg Tolan. No, there isn't. I love Greg Tolan. I'm a huge fan. He had yep. a really tragic life, dying young. Way and, too young. And um, Gra Grapes of Wrath is my, on my top five list. Right. And um, the, the best years of our lives. There's a really great, you mentioned the shot of the little boy playing and holding the focus, and that's, and you probably go into it in your book. I'm going to find out. Yep. The, uh, that's probably, it's the Greg Tolan lens that you developed for that. Is that right? Oh yeah, they they had a and, they had a breakaway table that took that that shot took almost a week to shoot. He used that same uh, he used that cleverly in uh, best years of our lives when they're playing at the piano oh, yeah. and the phone call and the booth that's thirty feet away and you hold focus on both of those shots. Yep. I know it's a different movie, but just Greg Tolan. I'm just curious. Have you written a book about Greg or have you ever? No, someone it? someone should. Uh, oh. His life is way too short. But you know. You don't even have to write a book about Greg Tolan. Just do scene stills of all of his movies, and that would tell the same story. If you ever want to, after you've gone home tonight and watched Citizen Kane, which of course we're all going to do, um, watch it sometime with the sound off. It's amazing. Uh, or watch it sometime with the picture off and just listen to it. I've done both as getting ready for this book. But just watching it with the sound off, the story gets told with nothing in the background. Uh, and the way the shots are developed, but looking at any film that Greg Tolan shot is worth it. So, I'm sorry, he, he was a little bit ahead of you, and then we'll come back to you if that's okay. So, yes, sir. Um, I'm just curious, do you know a bit about the history of the negative of the film? Did, did they preserve that original and when, when they have the current Blu-ray or whatever? No. I'll go back to the original. The, um, there are lots of stories, some too painful to even think really did oh. happen. It's actually, I'll make it short. It's actually possible the film could have been thrown out as junk uh, by accident by an idiot who, who took over running RKO uh, after when, when General Tyre bought it. Um, but there have always been and still are good 
first generation prints of it. And when the Blu-ray was made, they were used. And when one of the um, 4K versions was made, let's just say I would stick with the Blu-ray version for a while. The 4K versions are a problem, and I don't know why. Warner Brothers, which owns the video rights to Citizen Kane, has not done a 4K version. And mon tomorrow, I'm going to call Janet Wilson and find at, at, our, at Warner's and find out if they're ever going to do one. So you're saying the 75th anniversary version is better than the 4K one? Yes. And the... 80th anniversary, how about this, okay. The 75th anniversary looks fantastic. When I showed this on a big screen in El Segundo three months ago, four months ago, it looks great. The 4K does not. Um, but the, the Blu-ray version that came out with the 4K version looks fantastic also. But you can hardly go wrong with the 75th anniversary version. It looks great. <laughs> And if you really want to go crazy, go back to the laser disc, the big laser disc of the movie that, that well, Criterion still put out. a laser disc player, but the problem is... I know people who own a laser disc player just to watch Citizen Kane. So, well, but yes, it's... I, it, I have things to say about that, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll just say, like, for, for 12 bucks a while back, I bought the, uh, uh, the Blu-ray version of Casablanca. Oh, yes. I was just blown away at how incredible it looks Beautiful good, it works. and when I when we show at the same theater when at the by the way the, the Old Town Music Hall in yeah. in El Segundo is fantastic for watching old movies both silent and sound. Which I'm I'm going to be guesting speaking for Touch of Evil in April and Hard Day's Night in January, but um, we looked at the Casablanca 4K a month before we put it on screen. You know, like looking at it like this, and it looks okay. But 4K is a way, is not there yet, because they're still playing with the sound and getting the sound right. We actually showed the Blu-ray and not the 4K, and the, the 4K looks fantastic, so. But look which version I have. All I can tell you is on, a, on my 4K TV, it's just pristine. Yeah. It just looks beautiful. Yeah, why, yeah, blue, you can't get much better than the, a good Blu-ray looks fantastic. And on a 4K screen, which is what I have too, not big enough, but um, it looks great. Go, cool, please. Um, how come the studio executive need not defended the movie more than the I'm sorry, what? When the movie came out, yes. you mentioned that Hirsch was attacking the movie yes. and made sure that it was not distributed. Yes. How come the studio did not fight back? The studio fought back a lot. That's why the movie, the movie exists. The okay. movie, had, had Hirsch had his way, he would have spent $800,000 to buy the negative and destroy it. That that request came through his buddy Louis Mayer at MGM right down the street. Uh, MGM put, Louis Mayer put that offer out and it was declined. Um, of course, there would have been a massive lawsuit had it even been considered, but the point is it was there. But you know, the lawyers finally realized that the threat of a, of a suit was just as good to theater owners who couldn't take the chance. There were a lot of movies coming out. Citizen Kane, you know, who needs Citizen Kane? The threat I mean, the Fox West Coast Theater chain did not run the movie. They paid the fee that they had to pay just to get movies from RKO. They paid that fee, but there was no rentals from it. You know, an $150,000 loss, if, even, if only Fox West Coast Theaters had run the movie, they would have, the movie would have gone into the black. And even going to the black a little bit would have changed the history of the movie and the history of Orson Welles. Yeah, my big regret is one of those two failed projects was he was going to do Heart of Darkness, which just became too expensive. Joseph Conrad's story, which was later done as Apocalypse Now by Francis Coppola. That would have been a fabulous follow-up film. I think Magnificent Ambersons was a mistake um, because it just didn't draw anyone. Great. You've asked more questions than any group I've ever had, so thank you very much. Thank you.